This morning, it's good to have everybody here. Billy Barnett, it's great to have you back. As always, we'll give you a hand. How long are you here for? Just a few days, or? Just about the middle of the week. Okay, it's great to see you. Thank you. Um, as far as announcements, I've only got a couple. One is uh, you'll see in your book, and, and we'll have this there for the next uh, few weeks, you'll see an insert regarding. Uh, the updating of our church directory, our church phone directory. Uh, the Congregational Care Committee is taking care of this. Uh, we're, we, the, the other directory is only about a year old, but it's, it's kind of an update. So any information that you want to change or add or subtract or whatever, please indicate that if you will. And then as you see, you can either put the, the uh, slip in the frame or take it uh, to the church office. The only other announcement that I have is a reminder that, uh, that our regular a meeting of the Sunday afternoon class will be today. Does anybody else have any announcements? I do. Yes, Joe. This week, something very special is happening at Northwest. Well, something special is always happening at Northwest, <laughs> but this week is really something special. We have a big musical coming back to campus. It's the first time since since I was there, anyway. And but we have a big one opening Wednesday night. It's Aida, not the opera. It's the Disney. So your grandchildren, your children will know this show. So please go see it. It opens Wednesday night. I've seen bits and pieces of it already, and it looks great. I can't wait to see it. Thanks, Michelle. Are there other announcements this morning? Let us worship God. I can't go half my music. Okay. I was thinking about my announcement. <laughs> <laughs>
God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. In Jesus Christ, the past life of sin is gone and a new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, the
May the words that I speak and the meditations of my thoughts and our hearts be acceptable to you. You are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Let's join together responsibly this morning from a very familiar psalm, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills, and where will my help come? I am not comfortable. You will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The New Testament reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and with Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober and your suffering. Do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry for
morning is from Luke 18 verses 1 through 8. Uh, this is the text for the sermon, although I will be referring at one point to the text that Martha just read us. I invite us to listen again now to God's word. This is one of Jesus' uh, stranger or more shocking parables. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. <laughs> for a while, he refused. But later, he said to himself, no, I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by, my, by her continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Coming to faith in Jesus Christ and growing in faith in Jesus Christ <clears throat> are like learning to pray, like learning an art, learning a skill, learning a profession. If you think about it, when you're trying to learn a craft or trying to learn a skill, you may start out already with great talent for that undertaking that you're about to go through. But even great talent is of very little use if it's not developed and developed and developed more and more. Through repetition, through discipline, through discipline and repetition time and again. The great Asian masters, if you've ever read anything about them or have ever read their works, the great Asian masters have understood what I just said for centuries. We saw that in body in Yoshi a few years ago, four years ago, when he was with us. Um, some of you were here for the better part of the day. And he very intricately and meticulously tuned this piano to this one particular room. We were watching a true artist at work. We were watching a true craftsman at work that day ever so gently, ever so persistently practicing the art that had been a part of him and his people for centuries later. Right here in front of us, we saw, we saw an expression of centuries of <coughs> tradition, of persistence, and repetition, and repetition, and repetition. We saw someone who had truly mastered his art. In my morning and my morning devotional yesterday, I was uh, reading a uh, devotional by the 20th century, the early 20th century Catholic activist and journalist Dorothy Day. She was later, as probably you know, designated the saint of Catholic Church. 
This is what she said. Listen carefully to these words. She said, you must believe and you must make what is called an act of faith. And each act of faith increases our faith and increases our capacity for faith. You must make an act of faith. And each act of faith increases our faith and increases our capacity for faith. An artist, say a potter, <clears throat> doesn't just sit down at the potter's wheel and throw a piece of pottery that's a great beauty and great work the first time. If he or she does that, then it's pure luck. And it's really uh, that lucky moment, you might say, is really detrimental. Because then that artist might assume that that's all it takes, that they're that talented. The touch and the motion and the work have to be repeated over and over and over again with persistence until the potter can truly throw a pot that's a great beauty and great work and can do that over and over again. I bet you women in the prayer shop group probably know what we're talking about there. If you're an aspiring musician, you don't just sit down and don't just perfectly play the musical score, the notes and the measure the first time. You don't do it the 10th time. You don't do it the 50th time. You have to persist. You have to repeat until you've developed a sort of a sense and a, and a memory for how you and the musical instrument and the musical text all blend together. I once heard, by the way, this is a parenthetical, I once heard the great trumpet artist Quentin Marsalis compare the great running back Barry Sanders to that. He said Barry Sanders was like a musical artist. He was music in motion on the field. He didn't have to think about his mood. They just spoiled it. That's from practice and great natural talent. If you're trying to be a footballer, you don't learn the physical position and you don't learn the leverage that it takes to handle your opponent, whether you're blocking them or whether you're charging them. You have to practice that day after day after day until the muscles memorize the moves and they come natural. So now here's some of Paul's words in the text of Mark of Israel. Listen to some of these words and phrases again in 2 Timothy. And listen especially to how closely, how many times the theme occurred, the theme comes in his words of persisting in faith. He says that, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and what you firmly believe and from whom you learned it. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is, the, who is the judge, the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, and now listen carefully, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, encourage with the utmost patience to teach. And as for you, be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist and carry out your ministry fully. When Paul, or it may have been one of his disciples, when, when that person wrote those words, he was in prison and facing death sentence. And yet he had persisted in his faith and had that substance in his faith for that long and for that week. When we come to the gospel passage in Luke this morning, Jesus could not be clearer at all. He could not be more direct in what the theme of this passage is. With no extra words, we hear already in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray and not lose heart. Persistence, discipline, commitment. He's talking about practice, the practice of prayer, but he's also certainly talking about practice of faith. And then Jesus tells this parable. And it cannot help but sound like an offensive parable to us. He sets up this great contrast. And it's a contrast <clears throat> between this prominent, prominent but very unethical judge and this woman who's a widow. Now, you know that in that society, the woman has a double disadvantage. First of all, she's a woman. But secondly, she's a widow. She doesn't have... She has very few rights. She has virtually no power, no influence. And so we see this great wide gap between these two characters, these two people in the parable. Now, Jesus' words here leave no doubt as to the judge's character. Verse 2, in a certain city there was a judge 
who neither feared God nor had respect for evil. This is how one commentator sums up this judge's character. And it was the best comment that I came across about the judge. He says, the judge is not neutral. He's godless. <clears throat> He's not necessarily impious, but he is contemptible. Nevertheless, he holds a high office and he wields great power, so he, so he is a formidable figure. He says, at one level, this means the judge has no strings attached to him. But on the other side of the coin, he is self-centered, genuinely unconcerned with the normal structures of society. He does not care about God's commitment to justice, to kindness, to humility, or to love. That's the judge. That's the person that this woman, this widow, faces. So how could we possibly expect what she does in verse 3? Verse 3 says, in that city, there was a widow who, and again, hear the words, kept coming, persisted, kept coming to the judge saying, grant me justice against my home, small and insignificant against great. This insignificant and disrespected widow faces this great and prominent, even if he's an unethical judge, this egotistical judge, <clears throat> against this intimidating and imposing figure, the woman persists. She won't give in, she won't give up. What's the result of that? We never, we never expected. In verses four and five, we read, while the, for a while the judge refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this woman keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she will not wear me out by continually coming to me. And simply put, he just can't stand the test her anymore. <laughs> and if he doesn't give in, if he doesn't give her what she wants, she's going to wear him out. <laughs> now, if that is surprising, <laughs> if the judge's response is surprising, what Jesus says in the next verse, in verse 6, is a complete shock. We prepare for something else, but Jesus says, listen to what that unjust judge says. What could he possibly be saying? What could he possibly mean? It's disturbing to say the least. And it's not at all what we would expect him to say. He gives us the answer in verses 7 through 8. And here is the heart of Jesus' words. This is the heart. This is the, the heart of the theme of this passage. Jesus says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen one? To cry and pray to him every day and every night. Will he delay long in helping him? Remember how Jesus began the passage in verse 1. He told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. As profound as some other points in this passage are, and as amusing as the part of the exchange between the judge and the woman are, the most important points in this passage are not about the judge's corrupt character, not about even the woman's persistence and determination. <clears throat> the most important message in this passage is that God is the one who's trustworthy. God's the one who's trustworthy and faithful to us. Jesus is saying if even a corrupt, despicable person like this judge can do right, then how much more <clears throat> will God do for us who are his children, who are his people? God will hear and answer our prayers and our pleas and our needs because God is trustworthy. That's the promise in Jesus' words here. That's why we persist in our faith. We do the best that we can. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good enough. But God is trustworthy. And the more we persist in our faith, the more we grow in our faith. I can promise you that. I can guarantee you. I told this story a few years ago in a sermon. You may remember it. <clears throat> Mother Teresa of Calcutta, of course, she's saying to me, Teresa now, made an appointment to meet with the renowned lawyer, Edward Bennett Williams, and she was going to ask him for a donation for a hospital that she was building for AIDS patients. Now, this story is actually told by one of Bennett's uh, <clears throat> colleagues, uh, Williams' colleagues, because he was there in the room. He was part of this. The two of them were co directors of a very large and prestigious foundation that gave very large gifts, if you can imagine, if 
charitable causes. Well, <clears throat> before Mother Teresa arrived for the meeting, Williams and his colleague had, well, first of all, Williams had said, AIDS is not one of my favorite diseases. So the two men met, and they already decided basically to listen politely to Mother Teresa and then say a polite no and send her on the way. Well, she sat down in front of them with her hands already prayerfully folded, and she made a request, and then she said, before you answer, let us pray. And she bowed her head, and she began praying, and of course, the other two didn't believe in that. Williams rolled his eyes, and the two of them just sort of made the poking gesture, acting as if they were joining her in prayer. And after she said amen, she went through the request again. And they politely listened to her, they let her finish, and then they gave her a polite no. So Mother Teresa bowed her head and folded her hands and said, and let us pray. And they waited for her to finish and they said no again. You know what's coming. She called them to bow in prayer for three more times. <laughs> and the fifth time, the fifth time, Williams leaned across the desk and blurted out, all right, all right, get me the checkbook. <laughs> Growing in faith as this congregation and as individuals is not our doing. It's God's work through the Holy Spirit working with us. But for us, it's like an art. It's like a craft. It's something that the more we persist in and the more we deliberately live it out, the greater it will be and the greater it will increase. <clears throat> Over time, I've thought a lot about our different possible attitudes. I don't mean just us here, but anyone's possible attitude toward being committed in faith in Jesus Christ, being committed to the church. There are probably a lot of responses, but I, I can think of at least basically three. And one response is I want to grow in my faith, and I'm seeking that, and I'm trying to do that as consistently as I can. A second response, and I think it's probably more common for us, is I want to, but I'm not sure how to do it. I, I don't know what to do exactly. I don't know how to do it right. And the answer to that is, if we try, we're doing it right. We're doing, we're doing it the right way because there isn't one correct, specific, successful way. Faith is like that craft that we have to persist in and stay, stay disciplined in. And it's a lifelong learning. The third response, of course, is when it comes down to it, I don't really care much about growing in faith. I don't really care much about making a, a serious commitment. There are other things that are more important to me. Whatever our response is, Jesus' words are always going to be in front of us and they're always going to be true. That we should pray always and not lose heart. We come to a special moment in the life of this church now. It's a moment that uh, we, we haven't had for a while. Um, to share as a congregation with one of our own is profession, faith, and baptism, coming to faith and coming to membership of this church in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'll invite Daryl Sellers to come on. I want to invite y'all. I'll tell you. To come on. <laughs> <laughs> and Daryl, he'll just stand here with me a minute. It's so great. We've known, we've known Daryl for 10 years, and uh, it's wonderful to come to this point. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. Hear these words too from Holy Scripture from Ephesians 4. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. We're obeying Jesus Christ's own words and we're confident in his promises when we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show us that we belong to him, the life and the death. God frees us from sin and death and he unites us with Jesus Christ in his own death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. And we're joined to Jesus' own ministry of love and peace and justice. So let us remember our own baptisms as we celebrate this baptism. Yeah. Do you desire to be baptized? Do you? Yes, I do. Do you as a congregation, do you as members of this church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Daryl by your words, by your actions, with your love and with your prayers? And will you encourage him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of this church? Do you promise that? Yes. <laughs> Through baptism, baptism, we enter into the covenant that God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us each new life. He guards us from evil, and he nurtures us in love. When we embrace this covenant, we choose the one whom we will serve. By turning away from evil and turning to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So, Daryl, as God embraces you within this covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, and to confess the faith of the church, which is the faith in which we baptize. So, first, the question Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn away from the ways of sin and renounce evil and empowering the work? Very important and most important. Do you turn now to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obey his word, and show his love? Will you? I do. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you will send your spirit now to move over this water so that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. We pray that you wash away Daryl's sins as he is cleansed by this water. We pray that you will raise him to new life and join him to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on him and on this water so that he will have the power to do your will, so that he will continue forever in the risen life of Christ. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be all praise and honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Yes, you can kneel. Daryl chose to kneel. Daryl says, You are a child of God. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and stay in your heart now and always. Amen. Daryl, you are a child of the covenant. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism, and you are marked as Christ forever. Children and adults. Baptism is a reminder 
pray that you'll be close to those who are lost in spirit, those who are looking for Christ, but don't know where to look, but those who have found Christ are afraid to completely turn their heart and their will over to him. We bring all these prayers to you in his name, and now in his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of prayer. Amen. <coughs> worship the Lord in holy rest, and all we may come into his sanctuary. Let us worship God in heaven. Yeah, all things are like yours.
us and with God's people everywhere. Amen. 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 Thank you. 